All right, that should be recording. Um, welcome uh, to our first Thursday's presentation. Um, this is uh, one of our continuing presentations on anti-racism and um, this one focuses on uh, the library profession. My name's uh, Kevin Unrath. I know a lot of you here. Um, and uh, I wanted to thank you for taking the time today to um, think about this topic with some of, um, with uh, some great presenters that we'll have. I also just wanted to briefly say how good it is to see your names and your faces after such a um, challenging uh, day and night that we had yesterday. Um, I don't know if you were glued to the news or to Twitter um, like I was, but it certainly was a, a difficult and challenging night. And I am um, heartened to see so many folks here uh, who um, I think of not just as colleagues, but as friends um, interested in this topic, because I think we're doing really important and good work uh, by um, making an effort to understand uh, and combat racism. Uh, so thank you for taking the time out. Um, with that, I'll, uh, I'd like to introduce our presenters. When you all registered, you got to read their bios. Um, and I think many of you probably know uh, Mike, Jessamine, and Bridget, um, but uh, Jessamine West uh, is here to present a little bit on the history of um, uh, our library associations and profession. And then she'll turn it over to Mike, who's gonna present a little bit about what's going on today and has an interesting presentation technique that I look forward to trying out. Um, and then uh, Bridget, our, the director at the Georgia Public Library will be leading the question and answer. So um, with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Jessamine uh, to get us started. Great. Um did you want to talk about uh, the presentation that's happening in March? Oh, yes. Thank you so much. And actually, I see that Emily is here. Um, I don't mean to put you on the spot, Emily, but we do have um, uh, our next presentation is going to be in early March, uh, uh, the first Thursday of March. And let me just find um, the description. So um, Emily from Champlain College will be presenting um, using critical whiteness to study the experience of race in libraries. And uh, since you're here, I, I don't wanna, um, I won't go into too much detail, but if you would like to say a word or two about that, because I think folks who are here would be interested in, in hearing about that if you'd like. Sure, no problem. So um, thank you. This wasn't expected, but um, thanks for mentioning it. I really appreciate that. Um, so this is some work that I have been doing over the last semester, over the last fall, um, few months this fall. I'm currently working on my doctorate at University of Vermont in educational leadership and policy. And this is a study that I conducted in the fall that is using a critical whiteness lens, as you mentioned, Kevin, thank you. So looking at um, the phenomenon of whiteness and how it often functions as an invisible force um, and one that we have normalized in many ways as white folks. So it was looking at, um, at whiteness and how that's experienced by white academic librarians. So it's a qualitative study that involved interviews with academic librarians this fall and was asking them how they experience race and especially whiteness in their policies, practices, habits, behaviors. So I'll just be touching on that study and my results from it. Thanks. Great. I'm so looking forward to this. Emily, uh, that's also going to be a, a excellent sort of lead in. I'm going to uh, share my slides. Uh, there is a link to, because I'm going to touch on a lot of different things and there may be certain things you want to learn more about. Um, I have prepared, of course, a bibliography. So there's a link in the chat if anybody would like to um, either follow along with my notes and slides or click some links and uh, read some stuff. So uh, without any more talking, let me. Can I get a thumbs up from somebody that you can see my first slide? Great. 
Thank you very much. So I'm going to talk briefly about sort of a history of whiteness in librarianship. And I think Emily's um, framework is going to be a really good thing to think about. How How is uh, the whiteness that you may have or that you have with your colleagues, that your colleagues have, uh, affecting the way we view um, issues uh, within our profession? So the web address for the slides at the bottom in the chat, feel free to follow along there. It's also a more accessible version. There's a lot of reading on these slides, but the text is um, uh, right there next to it. So um, to just get started, um, when thinking about the issues of whiteness in librarianship, it's really important, I believe, to um, understand that this isn't just a random thing that happened. It's not just like a, it's not the weather, right? It's, it's, it's a thing that, was built on structural racism that existed and exists within the United States, but also people in librarianship made choices to make this situation, whatever the situation was, better or worse within this existing construct of structural racism. So as an example, uh, the Tougaloo Nine were uh, students in Jackson, Mississippi, who staged a read in at the library. They literally went into the library, which because of racist segregation laws were for whites only. In Mississippi, they started to read material for class assignments and the library staff decided, decided, made a choice to call the police. So just, you know, as a, as a way to sort of think about this. And this was 1961, right? I would be born seven years later. It's living memory for some of the people uh, we work with and among. So I've been doing a project, generally speaking, because we've all got to have wintertime hobbies, oh my gosh, uh, to make sure state library associations like VLA, all the states have them. And then there's like Southeast Library Association, NILA, PAC Northwest Library Association, et cetera, have Wikipedia pages because more often than not, people go online to look for information about our organizations. They can find our web pages, which is good, um, but sometimes it's also good to get that sort of extra boost of authority by finding something on Wikipedia. And in many cases, Wikipedia has higher, what we call search engine optimization than in fact our own library associations. So I had a little project, make some Wikipedia pages um, for these associations and putting these pages together, many of the pages existed already, some didn't, um, meant doing a lot of library association history research. And um, one of the things, and some of this is stuff that I've learned, some of this is stuff that I knew, um, but one of the things uh, that I did sort of learn about in the sort of history of libraries, maybe sort of post-Civil War, um, to at least the Civil Rights Act, which is mostly what I'm talking about, is, you know, Carnegie, we all know Carnegie gave out money for libraries. Yeah, you know, cool. Um, he, he did donate money to build uh, libraries for sort of mixed race use, but also he donated money to build white libraries, libraries that only white people could use. And then he also donated money, less, some, to build um, libraries that uh, were for black communities. And Carnegie was you know, one of the richest men in the world at this point in time. Carnegie could have used his immense financial power and leverage to lobby against uh, segregation instead of supporting it through uh, money for white communities. And he didn't. And, and again, just it's a choice, but but it's maybe not a value neutral one. Uh, this is a picture from the Cherry Street Library, which was a Carnegie Library in Evansville, Indiana, the only sort of non-Southern library that was built for a uh, Black community. Uh, great uh, history of the uh, Carnegie Libraries that were built for Black communities is on my list of links. You can learn about them. Many, almost none of these buildings still exist uh, anymore, which is its own sort of weird problem, I guess. And this theme, what can you do with your power and how much do you shrug and say, well, that's just the way things are, rules are rules, um, was seen repeatedly in the complicated history of library associations during the United States' uh, period of legalized racism in the form of segregation laws. Um, Danville, uh, Virginia is a sort of example. 
uh, Danville was uh, being told that they needed to integrate their library, but this was pre-Civil Rights Act. And uh, there were a whole bunch of basically grumpy white people in town who didn't think it was okay. And many of them had given money to fund this library. And that's a problem. And so Danville city leaders were trying to work out compromises with these racists. And then they came up with this really weird plan. And you can still find this like on the internet if you Google vertical integration where they opened and they just didn't have any tables or chairs. And what they did was they called it a get your book and get out plan. And so both black and white members of the community could use the library, but they couldn't use the library for hanging out with one another, nor could any of them hang out in the library. Uh, the citation, the last days of Jim Crow and Southern libraries, very interesting um, sort of recounting of how some of this worked. And the other thing that they did when they implemented this plan was they also uh, decided everybody needed to get a new library card at the library. And again, this was like 1961, I think. Um, and those library cards would cost $2.50, but it was only 50 cents if you only wanted bookmobile service. Now this picture that I have is the same building which they renamed for Ruby Archie, who was a noted black community leader. And this was only, you know, 45, 50 years later that, you know, the community did have an about face, but there are still people in the community who can remember when they weren't allowed to be using this library that has been named for this uh, community leader. So the American Library Association themselves, and this is sort of a top-down recounting, uh, they had a library conference in Virginia uh, in 1936. Uh, Virginia at the time was segregated and uh, black librarians were allowed to go to the conference, um, but they couldn't legally attend most of the sessions that happened in venues where they weren't allowed to be, or they had to be in a different part of the room. They weren't allowed to attend any of the banquet. And this is garbage, frankly, like just ridiculous. And conference reports about this time, and I often like kind of bug ALA about more information about this event because everybody kind of wants to sweep it under the rug and not cool. Um, they're often in sort of passive voice. Uh, black librarians were barred from many sessions because of segregation, as if segregation were just a law of nature and not a thing that people did to other people like a more active voice would be something like ALA chosen conference location where black librarians were unwelcome, right? Not cool, humans did this. And so this quotation on the page, the ALA did form at the end of 1936 in, you know, cause they got a lot of very negative pushback, of course. Um, they started the ALA Committee on Racial Discrimination. They approved a policy that said this would never happen moving forward. And to be fair, it never did. And as well, the American Library Association didn't meet again in the Deep South until they met in Florida sometime in the 50s. So this article came out very recently, um, the American Library Association and the Desegregation of Public Libraries by noted historian Wayne Wiegand. He's fascinating and a very readable guy. Um, they instituted ALA, a policy forbidding library conferences. And it is worth noting at this same time that ALA met in Virginia and there was all this nonsense, the Virginia Library Association made a different choice. The Virginia Library Association said, we're gonna be an integrated association. We understand that there are these laws that are going to uh, you know, inhibit some of the things that we are going to do. And instead of meeting at fancy hotels and having banquets that our members of color cannot attend, we're just going to meet in churches and high schools and cater our own food so that we can all be together. And that was a choice the Virginia Library Association made in order to be able to essentially what I would call do the right thing. Um, these are a couple more quotations about Southern Library Associations. Um, you know, Southern states had laws on the book about segregation, they had de facto segregated library associations. And when queried, you would see these sort of passive voice again. Library associations say they were open to members of color, but no African-Americans decided to join for some reason. 
and they weren't super introspective and they weren't working on this issue very hard. And if you read the stories about these arguments basically that happened within these associations, because it wasn't that everybody in the association was racist. It was often, however, that people in positions of power weren't anti-racist and in point of fact may have actually been racist and deliberately kind of kept you know, integration of the association from coming to a vote as one notable example uh, that happened or figuring out ways to have meetings like this top quotation. Uh, we voted to admit the members, but then we can't figure out how to have the meetings. Ridiculous, right? Completely. Um, and so in 1954, ALA, who had really actually, let's be fair, been working on this, um, barred states from having two separate associations because that is often how Southern states like Florida and North Carolina dealt with this issue. Um, my favorite Wikipedia article of all the ones maybe I wrote was the short history of North Carolina's Association for Black Librarians, which was called the North Carolina Negro Library Association. It was not around for very long. It had a stunning set of conferences with you know, Arthur Schomburg spoke at one of these conferences. Like it was amazing, big deal, big conference. And one of the downsides of NCNLA merging with NCLA was that black librarians who had been in positions of power in their own organizations found that they had a harder time achieving those same um, levels of power within um, the new association. So this is Dr. Finese, who's uh, the first black president of the North Carolina Library Association. And North Carolina Library Association integrated in 1955. So it was 20 years before they had a black president, which is suspicious, I think is the most charitable way I can look at that. And she goes on the record as being like, this was a garbage decision. Normally when you know two associations merged because of integration, the black and the white uh, presidents would take turns and trade off. And that's just not how it happened in North Carolina. And so in 1961, ALA, who at first had been like, well, what can we do? And then they were like, no, this is a, this is a disaster and we really need to deal with this, um, passed a policy requiring state chapters to recertify within ALA and affirm that they did not practice discrimination within their chapters. And in response to this, um, Louisiana and Mississippi libraries associations decided to leave ALA rather than choose to integrate. And similarly, but not quite the same, Alabama and Georgia just left ALA without going through the certification process. Georgia, they, there's a long article written about sort of Georgia's uh, inter association struggles here, and they just kind of couldn't get it together. And so as the person who wrote the Wikipedia articles for the Louisiana Library Association, the Mississippi Library Association, the Alabama Library Association, and at least edited the one for the Georgia Library Association, you can bet this information is on their Wikipedia page because it sure is important, which is not to say these organizations aren't necessarily doing righteous work now, but they were not then, and it's important to understand where we came from so that we can see where we are going. And so I think about kind of looking for the helpers, basically. The Virginia Library Association decided to have its meetings in schools and self-cater, right? They made the effort. The, Danvers, the Danville Public Library in Virginia renamed for a local Black leader and educator. Uh, and that was actually the first public library building named for any woman in Danville, Virginia, which is its own interesting story. Um, the Faith Cabin Library Project, this is kind of a grainy picture, but it's the opening day of this little log cabin library. Uh, they built nearly 100 libraries for Black students, mostly in South Carolina and Georgia, because the schools didn't have libraries and the kids weren't allowed in the public library. And this was an amazing project worth knowing about. And then there were, of course, the activists within the profession, E.J. Josie, one of my favorite librarian activists uh, went from lobbying ALA to change their racist policies. Um, he helped author the resolution forbidding association officers 
and staff from participating in state associations that denied membership to black librarians. So E.J. Josie couldn't go to the Georgia Library Association conference as a Georgia librarian, but ALA went and gave out awards and high-fived everybody. And he was like, nope, not okay. And he um, went from being the first black librarian to being accepted in the Georgia Library Association to being president of the American Library Association in 1984. And his story is incredible. Um, and now we look at ALA. They have a Black executive director, a Black president. They'll have their first Asian American president in 2021, Patty Wong. She's dynamite. And the Librarian of Congress, whose job has not been easy lately, um, is a Black woman who has radically transformed the Library of Congress. And then locally, of course, we have Jason Broughton, the first Black state librarian in Vermont, who's been doing a bang up job. Um, both running the state as things have been very difficult and also having great discussions of not just anti-racism, but how to talk about anti-racism. And so we muddle forward together. We should do better. It's a tricky issue because your relationship to anti-racism can depend on your background and your history. Obviously, I'm a middle-aged white lady that lives in a rural area in Vermont. Um, and that informs my perspective in some ways. And also like, I'm a Jewish lady who lives in Vermont and there's like five other Jewish people in my town, also a different perspective. And so thinking about the contradictions, if you're a white person in racial justice work, if you're a person of color in racial justice work, there are a different set of complicated contradictions. And so we do it together and yet sometimes from different perspectives. And so this is the beginning and not the end of the work. And I really appreciate your time and